Today is Wednesday, April 11th. Did I get that right? April 11th. Yeah, looks like that's right. Hold up the calendar. Calendar. <laughs> oh, this episode is going to be security and... Government policy. Government policy, yeah. But not in that order. But not in that order. Policy first and then, then security because we don't know what we need to be secure against if it's not, you know, something, something. I don't know. Terrorism. Terrorism. Yeah, something, something terrorism. That's a lot of stuff. The first story that we have that's something, something terrorism is that the Homeland Security wants to compile a database of journalists and bloggers. Well, nothing has ever went wrong with compiling a list of people. I mean, why don't we just go ahead and ask for religious affiliation while we're at it? Give them an armband. (laughs) I was going with the Red Scare, but you just went right to Nazi Germany. (laughs) So they're talking about uh, collecting, and it's interesting, they go, it's not just who they are, but you know, their political leaning. One of them said, uh, like, what they drill down into other countries, like what tribe do they belong to? What is their background? Things like this. They want a really detailed list. They also want it to automatically translate from a whole bunch of languages into English. So that's good, I guess, in terms of monitoring. And, <laughs> or it could be bad. <laughs> or it could Probably be bad. bad. It's like, it's like the request comes amid hot and concerned about accuracy in the media and the potential for foreigners to influence U.S. elections through policy and fake news. Yeah, didn't didn't we get really upset about Al Jazeera? We want them to register as a foreign agent now or something because they're fake news. Oh, what about RT? Yeah, Russia Today. I think they already. Yeah, I think they actually. Uh, yeah, they were they were one of the people that had to register as well. I you know to make a long story short, as an American, I don't think that. Uh, Anybody in this space is behaving innocently. So why can't we just tell American citizens that and move on? <laughs> well, the the fake news thing at this point, I, I didn't think it would last this long because it's sort of like the weapons of mass destruction. You know, or, <laughs> of, our, of our age. <laughs> or the neo-McCarthyism that we're experiencing. It's like you just use it for every overreach. That's always the excuse. But it's still going strong. <laughs> I would. Uh, it would no, nothing would please me more than to find out that, like, you know, you know, I Justine or Marcus Brownlee or something are actually Russian agents. That would be amazing. And it's like, oh, well, the database said they were. So that's. <laughs> you think, here's the real question, though. Would you be in the database? Yeah, we would definitely be. I don't know if we. I don't think we're that popular. I don't popular. know if we'd qualify. We're kind of niche. I don't know if, yeah, we probably wouldn't be. I mean, yeah, why would we be? I think I, that would be a proud day for us if we got into the database. <laughs> Can we put that on our channel banner? Like... <laughs> definitely on a watch list. <laughs> Uh, so this is literally building, it's like, uh, you know, contractors to seek and build the watch list. So, yeah, to monitor 290,000 global news sources that uh, that they've identified. Of course, by the time you're watching this, submissions are due today. So hopefully you got your submission in so we can take a look at this. And they actually, uh, you know, a lot of news agencies have asked for comment on this. And the comment uh, on this came from Twitter and the tweet from the, the DHS exec that was... Uh, Looking at this set, oh, this is all tinfoil hat. This is all standard operating procedure. Everybody has this. There's nothing unusual going on here. We just want to monitor situations and bloggers and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, wow, okay. It's kind of like when IBM said that all they were doing is providing stuff for record keeping and monitoring people and equipment and stuff. Right? Which was true. Yeah. But it's not wrong. <laughs> I think it was wrong. And this does, uh, you know, it's, it definitely borders on that whole freedom of the press thing, you know, because. If you know that someone is monitoring you and has all this information about you and they are super powerful and can secretly arrest you if they want to and have secret courts, is that not a chilling effect? I think it is. Tyler Holton was the the guy that I was trying to get the tab to load. Uh, Despite what some reporters may suggest, blah, 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 it is fit for tinfoil hat wearing and black helicopter conspiracy theorists. Why, yes, I am actually a card carrying member of that organization but But, the the black helicopters definitely exist i mean how can we pretend that there aren't sometimes black helicopters i I love like every time this comes up i love bringing up it's like you you know would you say that it was would be absurd for our federal law enforcement organization to try to convince a political activist in america that was an american citizen to to commit suicide that's absurd that would never happen actually happened to martin luther king and that's really the Tip of the iceberg in terms of... <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's way worse than that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you got to start somewhere, and then it's like, no, we totally didn't do that. There's, There's got to be some context for that. No, we literally did really, really horrible things. And that's not to say that other people aren't doing really horrible things either. I just think that we can aspire to be better than we are, and this is not. Or 
minimally, I don't know about this aspiring bee. I mean, that's, that's humanity. <laughs> but what we can do is not buy into this crap that's like, ah, oh, this is just the usual thing, you know, and allow things like this to go unquestioned. We should, this is, at, you know, this is the exact kind of thing that you question. Yeah. I mean, it's the, crazy. The people and then get that, put away because you're on the list. And and the, so yeah. You're it's like you, you're literally on the list. Maybe. Like, I just wanted people to think. Maybe that's how we get on the list. <laughs> <By asking people laughs> We're actually to trying to get on the list. <laughs> and like some, some government guy shows up and he's like, listen, trying to be on the list means you'll never be on the list. <laughs> and that's the loophole. It's very sassy. That's how we get away with it. We we defeat their spying stuff by not being relevant. <laughs> uh, a former Obama FTC chair is now a Comcast lobbyist fighting against lobbyist. Net News. Lobbyist. I can't I can't talk today. I don't know what the deal is. A uh, Comcast lobbyist fighting against net neutrality. So I seem to recall Ajit Pai saying this is an FTC thing. The FTC is going to take care of this. This guy is not with the FTC anymore. He's a lobbyist. But he is lobbying real hard for Comcast in anti-net neutrality stuff inside the FTC. Yeah, or for uh, two people in the FTC, I should say. We've talked a lot about the revolving door. And it seems like maybe it's just it's what we care about the most. I don't know about other regulatory agencies. But when it comes to FCC, FTC technology stuff, the revolving door is severe. And It does seem bad. You, of course, a G Pi will be the best example of this because, of course, he came from Sinclair Verizon. When he goes back, he is going to get such a sweet job. Can you imagine? It's going to be amazing for him. <laughs> He's literally going to be like Biff Tannen in the Back to the Future movie where he was like the <laughs> mogul from all the betting. That is going to be his job when he goes back. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I think we need another data point on the whole... This is not legitimate government. This is just a bunch of people doing cronyism. And if we need another data point on that, then the uh, FCC broadband advisory panel is under fire for, for cronyism. So this is not the first report that we've had of this. There have been two people that have left this that have said, look, this is basically cronyism. Our, our objections, our concerns are sort of going ignored and they're basically doing whatever the incumbent industry wants, which is not in the best interest of the people or the, the best interest of, of, of broadband and distribution for citizens. It's, I think it's actually three. There was the mayor of San Jose last year. One of the big web companies had a guy who left. And now it's the chief technical officer of the state of New York who has decided to leave. And they all say the same thing. It's a dog and pony show. It's loaded up with industry insiders. It's catering to them, and we're wasting our time. That doesn't seem like that's a good idea. That doesn't seem like this is sort of the open thing that a Jeep pie has promised. Oh, well, it's, def it's definitely what he promised. It's just <laughs> not what he promised to the American people. <laughs> He's drinking their tears out of that giant mug of his. <laughs> the, the giant uh, Reese's mug. Yeah. He's, he is smug about that. I think that his smugness in that ultimately will catch up with him. I don't know how, but... In order for the executives involved in this corruption to not be the fall guy, he's going to have to be the fall guy. And I don't think he realizes that. I'm not sure he'll ever get to that point. <laughs> it might not. I mean, it just depends. I mean, maybe the government, you know, the, the, the Republicans will lose and the Democrats will take over. Or maybe a new independent party or maybe space aliens will come and invade the planet and then there will be a change of direction. I don't know. but change I think of direction culminating in the destruction of the human race. <laughs> I think the best we can hope for is that. Because he's such a horrible person, he'll raise terrible kids, <laughs> and they'll abandon him. And then when he's in the nursing home in his old age, the orderlies can take their revenge <laughs> because of what he's done to the internet. That's, that's really dumb. I'm not encouraging that. But what if it happened? What if it, what if it was like, who would even know that like, all those younger kids, you know, they don't even know what the internet was like. But then no, there's but one really old orderly. We're writing a movie right no, now. No, but they'll, they'll be like on their phone, and they'll keep getting like, pop-ups and you know their identity will be stolen because their data was stolen and compromised and Recent stuff and they'll just go in there and burn them with cigarettes <laughs> it's really dark <laughs> we're selling those film rights if anyone's interested <laughs> one dollar governor kate brown will sign oregon's net neutrality bill on monday so this is maybe like it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out because states may not be allowed to do this this may be just federal laws one of the ways that states are getting around the whole federal law thing is by saying, look, you're a communications company. If you want to do business with state government, 
you have to agree to neutrally treat the packets on your network and not do any kind of paid prioritization, which maybe does an end run against the federal regulations, but actually codifying this in law, I, I, that's different than a business arrangement with the federal government, so it's going to be interesting to see how this shakes out. I think ultimately this is going to go to the Supreme Court. Oh, they're going to get sued. Yeah. No, no question about it, really. I just... It's nice that they're doing this, but I can't help but wonder if some politicians are doing this to jump on the whole lip service bandwagon. It's an easy thing to do because you don't really risk much. No. And, you know, you're going to, especially in a place like Oregon, that's really going to get you some votes. Yeah. So that's a cynical way to look at it, but it's a dark world. (laughs) Until I see more activism. Cynical is going to be the default thing because look at what we're surrounded by. It's very disappointing. I don't know if activism really can do much at this point. Yeah. Yeah. The battle has already been lost. Might as well put our energy towards something else. Speaking of things that are losing battles, uh, remember the, uh, I guess we should probably give some backstory on this. So there was a guy that had some information in Microsoft services overseas in Ireland. Ireland. In Ireland. And that person is also not a U.S. citizen, apparently. They're, he's a foreign national. Has nothing to do with the U.S. But the U.S. DOJ wants this guy's info because they think he's a terrorist or a criminal or something. And that data is stored in Ireland. And so the question is, can a U.S. court compel Microsoft to help a U.S., you know, the U.S. Department of Justice get information from a server that's located in Ireland against an Irish citizen? Or a citizen, not a U.S. citizen, a foreign citizen. That's never, presumably never been to the U.S. And the answer it is foregone conclusion because the Cloud Act has answered this question. Microsoft, when they were responding to this, they were sort of like, well, you know, we got to protect our customers unless con- Congress were to act, then we <laughs> wouldn't have any choice, right? So Congress immediately acted. We got the Cloud Act. And the story here is the Sup- Supreme Court is basically like, well, this is settled. So as long as Microsoft is happy and we're happy, we just sort of, everybody signs the paper and it's over with, and that's what's happened. Yeah, it's, it, it, the Cloud Act probably took a year to pass, or a year to like be put together and pass, but this is only two weeks that have passed. So from the time that the Cloud Act has passed, the DOJ got a new warrant under the Cloud Act, went to Microsoft, and Microsoft's general counsel was like, yeah, we have no hope of winning this case now because this new law literally says that we have to turn over this information, and so we're just we're not going to fight it. So I don't think that Microsoft really can be faulted here. Although, how long before Russia demands data on American citizens? Because isn't that isn't there a thing in the Cloud Act that requires cooperation with foreign governments on this I, kind of thing? We also should mention that the Cloud Act, you know, you talk about, well, did Congress, did they look at this and did they debate and they took the, the constituents in and they asked them what they wanted? No. no, they snuck this in on the omnibus spending bill. It was this not was, even debated. Yeah, this is one of those things where it was like, hey, sure would suck if the government shut down. We better pass this spending bill. And they crammed all this extra crap into it. And this was one of those things. So, I feel like we have that story every week now where there's like <laughs> yeah. one or two things that you know, are passed that way. We were talking about that last week because, of course, you know, in Kentucky, there's a big story about that. And uh, it really is. It's a crazy way for government to work. And It doesn't really work. Well, it's true. <laughs> it works for right. some people. Works for a very small amount of people, very well. <laughs> a very small amount of very powerful people who demand things, and it's like we're just going to do this. It is really disturbing that this is what's happening. I mean, you know, I'm going to feel real bad if the guy in Ireland is like some sort of super criminal or something, but this just seems like a terrible way to I, conduct what business. What if it's the Lucky Charms leprechaun? I don't care <laughs> if he's literally the next Hitler. We I'm cannot. Sure. We cannot allow this to happen. Just because of that. That's crazy. And one of the other laws we reported on a couple of weeks ago that passed is uh, warrant is no longer required to get your data with cloud providers. It's like, no, this is totally business records or this is totally, you know, whatever. Or however, they're going to reclassify it. So all of your Facebook data that Cambridge Analytica has now accessible to law enforcement, now accessible to foreign law enforcement because of the Cloud Act, presumably uh, providers, companies, American companies or companies that have a presence in the U.S. that exist elsewhere. Presumably that data is up for grabs as well. But also, in, in not related to that, but also other stuff that's passed, is the um, uh, the law about stopping online sex trafficking and site operators being responsible for things. Now, I, I, I seem to recall us kind of making fun of Craigslist for immediately stopping uh, the personal... personal yeah, the personal section. Because, I mean, it's Craigslist. 
it, it, it's just Craigslist is like the most rock dumb simple website ever, and it's like that seems kind of reactionary that you would just immediately take down personals. I mean, doesn't it Craigslist? I mean, are those really going to go over go away immediately? Well, the feds have seized Backpage.com. Now, Backpage, they had gone after them once before. And I think Backpage won some kind of court case saying that it's yeah. like, no, no, no. We're just letting people post their own thing. So we're not responsible for any of this. This is all their stuff. And like another, like you pointed out, these laws passed. And clearly, they had been preparing all of this crap yeah. months beforehand. And they just waited for the other shoe to drop, and then they just went right after everything. So the FBI actually went in, seized Backpage. I wonder how long they were watching it before they put up the seizure notice. Watching it purely for investigative purposes. Well, I mean, <laughs> like, because they've done this with the uh, the dark web marketplaces, where we actually did a story about the, remember the child pornography story? Mm -hmm. where they seized one and ran it and ran it for a year. That should not be. Illegal. They were distributing child pornography for a year yeah, to never, do some kind of sting. That is, that is so abhorrent and unacceptable. I cannot believe there has not been a congressional investigation yeah. into that. That is literally a criminal act. And if well, not even just a criminal act, but like a, just a general scummy <laughs> human being, one act. of the, one of the lowest things a human being can do, but let's think about it in this case, let's say that Backpage really is sex trafficking. There's a lot of that going on. If you do that, how many young girls do you let commit to a life of sexual slavery in order to run your case? It's dark. <sighs> well, it's and dark times. And do we really think that Backpage shutting down Backpage will actually shut this down? It's like no, they're just yeah. going to go to encrypted, you know, apps for this. It'll temporarily shut it down until they go somewhere else. Yeah, it's not. There's you can't you can't erase the behavior by erasing the mechanism because it's the mechanism is communication and it is too easy to have a different mechanism of communication and if you seek to have this level of control you seek to control all communication and it that is too dangerous of a power to have you can also make the argument that the profits from this sector are driven by prohibition and you're literally creating the market controlling the market and in some cases creating your own marketplace <laughs> in the Running name of market. justice and it's it's a, it's a lot of uh unintended consequences or are they unintended who knows but it's a it's a bad idea well now i'm depressed let's move on to the next story it doesn't get much better it really doesn't google seeks to limit the right to be forgotten by claiming that it's journalistic so yeah the the right to be but this is the, the reporter here goes a long way to say google doesn't claim to be journalistic. They claim to be this is just a mechanism up to a point. And then it's like, okay, well, we just want you to delete everything about this person. And then all of a sudden it's journalistic, which I think is a fair point against Google. But at the same time, it is a, a really onerous requirement to have to have them deal with all of this, especially from all of the people that, that you want to do this. Because obviously you don't want people to be able to memory hole stuff. But at the same time, it would be nice for individuals to be able to be forgotten. So I, I don't think it's a black and white issue. In this case, though, they are being sued by two individuals who were convicted of white collar crime. And they're trying to use the right to be forgotten to have that taken off of Google because I, I don't know. I mean, if, are they going to go back into business? Let's say that you're going to be going to partnership with one of these guys. So you do a quick Google to see what they've been up to in the past. Shouldn't You'd want you, to know. Shouldn't you find out that they were in white collar <laughs> crime? So I don't know if this is the best. Uh, this is probably a bad argument because it seems pretty one sided in terms of. I don't think crime should be allowed to be forgotten. Yeah. And it and it's not like there's a big page that was like, watch out for Bob Smith. He's a thief. Unless this you're is, on Topics.com. Yeah. This, <laughs> this is just news stories about crimes that happen, yeah. and they want those taken down. Now, if you watch our news program a lot, it's it's probably easy to be depressed. I think we take a little bit of a nihilistic approach to it. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of people that are looking at the world around them and they're thinking, hey, you know, the grass is greener in Canada. Wait, what? Canada, <laughs> Canada has pulled a brain heist, uh, pulled off a brain heist is this article. And if you look at it, it's like, oh, they've scooped up all these scientists and, and these people that are unhappy with the state of affairs in the U.S. and in Europe and, and elsewhere. And now they all live in Canada and they're really smart and they're going to make Canada's economy even more better. Make Canada great again. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't have... Mugga. 
That doesn't that doesn't have the Quite flow. The same. But if you really if you read into this, they they sort of spin it. Axios Axios is one of those sites where they I don't know, they have weird skews on what was the story where they were like way into one of those laws and it's like, whoa. <laughs> it was that's... one of those uh, political funding laws or something. Yeah, it's like why how can you say it's a good thing? They're sort of spinning this as Canada being like, hey, Trump's a piece of crap. <laughs> Come to Canada. But then you read into the the deal that they made these guys. It's like great housing, great laboratories and facilities to work in between, funding. yeah, like two hundred fifty thousand to a million dollars per year in funding. <laughs> I, Personally, even if I loved Trump, hell, I'd go to Canada. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, man, you want to fund all my research? And who cares? Oh, yeah. Who cares who's in the White House? That's a sweet deal. It's uh, it's almost like after World War II, what could possibly propel the United States into a world superpower? And it's like, oh, all of the scientists from all the countries that were blown up came to America. Woo! Uh, there are a couple of Nazis in there, too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it doesn't matter as long as they're doing science for Uncle Sam. <laughs> I don't, I don't we know. don't discriminate. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe in some cases we should discriminate. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the Japanese internment camps. <laughs> we want to try to not remember that. <laughs> and they went right back into that dark hole. God, can you imagine if they were doing that today? They would just memory hole the crap out of that. It's like, we never had internment camp. We had day Summer camps. camps. <laughs> Summer camps. You mean like Guantanamo? <laughs> <laughs> if that were still going on today? <laughs> Being cash-free puts us at risk. Swedes turn against cashlessness. I don't know what's going on in Sweden, but you guys are doing something right. You read this article and it's like, the Swedish people are waking up. All of a sudden, we're realizing that our financial system is controlled by Visa and MasterCard. And if those servers go offline, it could shut down our economy. Why? But I think it's a very small amount of them. And the the government's response is like, ah, you're just being crazy. (laughs) This is the greatest thing ever. Look how, you know, futuristic we are. We're the best. (laughs) And they do show that a lot of of the Swedish people, because their government comparatively is really great. I mean, you think about like, look at all the stories that we've just talked about. Yeah. And have we ever done a story about Sweden's government doing some, (laughs) you know, doing something amazing? To be honest, I don't know a whole lot about Sweden other than, you know, the Swedish fish. (laughs) The bikini team. Yeah. I don't want to bury fish and eat it a month later. That would be bad. <laughs> so, but there are, a, there's a small amount of people, at least there are some people who are like, well, you know, let's look at history. What if we go to war? What if there's a really bad war? What if Putin invades the island? The, there's apparently an island that has a data center on it or something. Or like, hey, if Putin invades that island, it's going to take our data or uh, transaction processing capabilities offline because all of our banks run through that island. And then you're talking about there's no cash. You're using bottle caps at that point. And that's maybe a bad idea. <laughs> Yay, go Sweden. We need more people. Would you like you should come to the forums at level one? We got some amazing merchandise. Maybe you should create some threads on the forum. We can send you some swag. You could plug the store and like our program. Forum dot level two text dot Sweet. It's like a better version of us, but they're yeah. all Swedish. Free loot fisk for everyone. <laughs> Sadly, we don't take cash. <laughs> Something about money laundering. I don't know. There's a lot of tax laws. This is a follow up from last week. We reported that Russia was using perfectly quote unquote legitimate legal maneuvering to demand the Telegram turn over its encryption keys. The parallels in this case, honestly, I, I thought about reading this story. And not putting any kind of like using any of the Russian names or mention what story it is. Because this story is exactly like the uh, the uh, LavaBit Snowden thing where LavaBit has their encrypted email service. And the feds wanted LavaBit to modify their service so that they could spy on the otherwise well implemented and executed encryption system. Well, Russia wants the Telegram messaging app to modify their services. So that they can spy on it. And that, that, that is a Russian-based company, kind of like LavaBit was, was an American-based company. And, uh, you know, this, on the surface, in terms of legal maneuvering, and it, it's really hard to tell those two cases apart because the state wants this and Telegram is not complying. And so Russia has filed a lawsuit to block the Telegram messaging app within their borders. And so they're, they're basically saying, hey, our intelligence services asked for this. We've gotten lawful warrants. They're not complying they're they're trying to get their own funding through an ICO, so we just need to just cut them off, basically. But 
Hmm? Is there, I mean, is there, is that it? Is there nothing else? No, I think you covered it. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. I'll be honest and say to you, I kind of zoned out a little bit because you were talking. And I was it's, like, I, it's just like lava bit. It's it just so, lava. it's just so frustrating because like there's not, the way the story is written, it's like, look, Russia is so illegit, but it's the same as we're doing in America. It's exactly the same. If only we could be best friends. Putin and Trump. I think Buddy cop movie. I think there's something, there's a lesson to be learned there because it's, it's the same. It's the same. And so it's like, you know, I wonder if there are like, you know, computer nerds in Russia that are like, oh, my government's crazy. I don't know. It's just the way it is. Is wow. that your attempt at a Russian accent? They say that in private. <laughs> <laughs> you know who else is crazy? T-Mobile in Austria. They're storing part of their customers' passwords in plain text. So if you have T-Mobile in Austria, I'm so sorry for you. This is terrible. This is a terrible, terrible idea. I don't know if it's, can we really say they're not doing that here? Uh, it could very well be. Maybe. So the way they found this out is a someone on the support call lines told the customer, hey, yeah, I can see the first four characters of your password. And the customer knew enough about security and passwords to say, no, you can't. That's crazy. T-Mobile would never do that. And so I think they had like a little Twitter argument or something. And T-Mobile admitted, yes, I'm looking at it right here. I have it. And then they sort of tried to explain to them how cryptographically that is the worst possible thing that you could do. <laughs> uh, there was a tweet there that was like, they're very secure. I don't see it in the article, but I did go read the uh, well, yeah, Twitter the, chain. And it's like, it's an, oh yeah, it's amazingly good security. Yeah, the, the customer was like, you know, that's bad because here's why for, you know, cryptography. And then their response was, or maybe it's not because we have really amazing security. And it's like, what? <laughs> it, it, that's like, if you're not hip to security... That's like the robot, the program where you tell the robot, this sentence is a lie. It's like, we have really amazingly good security because we store the first four passwords not encrypted. It's literally, it can't, it, by definition, it cannot be. Or is it? It's an, it's an impossible state. So I think that person shouldn't have revealed that information, technically. <laughs> I mean, like, that's not, I'm sure that's something that they don't want to be out there, and that's just a very stupid person. But it's good that we've now figured it out because maybe they will stop doing it. Stay tuned next week for hundreds of thousands of T-Mobile customers' passwords have been compromised. <laughs> it's probably already being posted on a new site right now. <laughs> it's going to be a week old when we get to it. Uh, in this week's How Not to Write Your Antivirus Scanner, we have a story from Microsoft. It turns out the Microsoft malware protection engine can be tricked into executing code. So if you download a RAR file, which is a compression scheme, and the antivirus engine scans it, if it's maliciously crafted, it can start executing arbitrary code on your machine as the virus scan engine, which is extra mega bad. Yeah, and it's very common to download RAR files from the web. I mean, you know, compression and archiving, that's very useful stuff, and a lot of websites use it. And something like a man in the middle, or, you know, even they could compromise some external server and replace those downloads with their own. There's a lot of ways you could get this, even if you're being very careful. And the very software that claims to protect you from it is what's going to cause it to execute. For you exchange admins out there, yeah, somebody emailing you a RAR file can infect your exchange server. So good luck with patching. Yeah. <laughs> and good luck with explaining to your users why they're not allowed to accept RAR files anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to be some angry phone calls. Oh, the you know the the magical thing about the RAR file format though is that you could rename a RAR file to a zip file, and it uses mime magic to figure out that that archive is not actually a zip file; it's a RAR file because it's handled by the same compression subroutine. And so, I don't think you're going to be able to get around it by just simply blocking the uh, the dot RAR <laughs> extension. Seven zip. <laughs> That's a name I haven't heard in ages. Brian Krebs is reporting that the uh, the Secret Service is warning of a chip card scheme. So, you know, if you've got a bank card that has a chip, you know, the chip and pen thing, it's unhackable, right? No. Yeah, show the picture. Yeah, it's, they've, they've figured out a way. So what they're doing is in the mail, they will intercept your card. Some, this is apparently an inside job at the Postal Service. They're trying to figure it out. But your bank mails you a new card. They will literally replace... Oh. 
Well, there's the boiler. You know who cares a lot about credit card security? <laughs> I don't. I can't tell you how many times Boiler Snug's credit card has been stolen. Because of course he's trapped in the office here. He has to do all of his shopping online, <laughs> and uh, it happens a lot. He literally could not survive if it weren't for Amazon. That yeah. is true. It gets really, really terrible when you're trying to like just get a drink from the fridge or something, and he just interrupts you just to be like, "Hey, I got my credit card info stolen," and you have to listen to him rant for 20 minutes. <laughs> Is he done? Is he done? Maybe. Mm. Shouldn't even be on today, really. Uh, it's pretty cold. It won't be colder later this week, but that's our weather segment. <laughs> so this scheme apparently involves intercepting the credit cards and then cutting the chip out and putting a dead chip in because they can't use the chip until you activate your card. So you have to activate your card and then they can use the stolen chip. And until you use your dead card... You won't realize that you've been had. And usually you authorize the, the you, you do like you get it, and it's like, hey, call this number. So you call the number, you authorize it, and then they've got a window of time to go crazy with your card before you figure out that it doesn't work. And most banks are like, Well, no, your card was physically present, you used your card, and it's gonna be real hard for people to get their money back until they real realize what the scheme is. So the Secret Service is on it, but just be warned, check for tampering and all sorts of other stuff with your debit card. They use they just heat it and slide it out. So I don't know if it's obvious when you look at it. Now they do say that this is usually more corporate victims because they want someone with a lot of credit, and it's hard to target when individuals will be getting a new card. And like you say, maybe the they, postal service. Something about the mail they have to be able to intercept it. So it's uh, there's a lot of inside job going on here, but it's pretty serious if they pull it off. Yeah. Also from Brian Krebs this week, Panera. Do you have a My Panera card? Well, I've got some bad news for you. Your information's been lost. All of it. Every bit of it. So this is information that was publicly available on the Panera Bread website. But worse than this, Panera seemed to like, handle this in the worst way possible. Literally, can't think of a company that handled this security incident worse. It's crazy. Oh, what? Intel? <laughs> Equifax? <laughs> Equifax, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah, they knew, what was it, a year? Yeah, they knew for a year. The some researcher found it, and he got in touch with him. He was like, "Hey, look what I can get from your website." And you had to get these records one at a time, but the database key was sequential, so you could just keep going when you figured one out. And he was like, "Look what I could do!" And they were like, "I don't believe you. You're just, you know, you're trying to extort me." And they ignored him. <laughs> <laughs> they unfriended him, and that went on for a year until I think uh, Krebs. The Krebs himself, got involved, I yeah. think, and they knew the name, so they were like, oh, maybe we should fix that. And, of course, it probably took 10 minutes to fix. They didn't. Well, no, the, the fixing it was more interesting than that. They were like, we got it fixed. It was real quick. It wasn't really a big deal. But the fix was incomplete, and then they took the website down, and they put it back up. They took it down. They put it back up. And it was just a huge mess because Brian Krebs kept going back to it to look at it, and it was still a huge mess. And I don't know. I'm, I don't know if it's really actually been 100% fixed at this point, but... Uh, this is this is probably going to be a little bit of a developing story. It's who knows if they're even going to notify people that's like, hey, or if they even kept logs. Did anybody keep logs of who accessed what, what ID? How how does this work? Well, they have to have payment records. So everybody from the last year, that's got to be a lot of people. And you can see in that picture what they've got. They've got you know all your contact details, last four digits of your credit card, birthday. It's a decent amount of stuff. Yeah, it's a lot of. It'd be great for stealing somebody's identity for sure. Speaking of Equifax, you mentioned Equifax. Massachusetts can sue Equifax over the data breach, a judge has ruled. So this is a minor victory, but I have a feeling this is going to turn political real fast. I really don't see Equifax getting any kind of serious repercussion from what has happened. Well, these two lawsuits, they did say that uh, Equifax had some kind of call or something, and they've allocated a bunch more money toward the losses <laughs> because of this ruling. So I, I preparing for the worst, maybe, but... It doesn't seem like it's good for him, which may be some justice. Who knows? Now, right before we shot the news, a new breaking story happened in security, and that is uh, Russia and Iran have been hit by a global cyber attack that left the U.S. flag on screen. So, oh, there's a picture of it here somewhere. Oh, is there? I, didn't see the uh, I don't think there was one. In that oh, thing. they updated it. It's here somewhere. It's just a woman sitting on a toilet for some reason. <laughs> what kind of ad is that? <laughs> scroll down. Let's, let's answer the important questions. Oh, that poor girl. Oh. Oh, it's a dude now. I can't read that. <laughs> probably something about I need like more fiber. Oh, she's in my celebrating. Diet. Oh well. Oh, yeah, it's probably like a prescription. It is a prescription. 
Yeah. Lenses. Wow. Because uh, I can't uh, poop. I don't know. Anyway, uh, this was a Cisco router flaw that they actually already fixed and pushed out a patch. And some ISPs decided not to patch. <laughs> and that was remote execution. And this happened. Yeah, it's not really severe. Uh, I think you can disable like VSET memory or something and uh, like VSET stack memory. And it's not really a big deal in terms of it was more vandalism than actual like command and control infrastructure. But the message that was left on screens was like, yeah, don't mess with our elections or something like USA, that. USA, USA. It's like, Jeez. I can't imagine the USA would be that ham fisted, but at the same time would Russia really break its own stuff? I don't but, know. But also the, the irony. Maybe I mean, the Chinese are just trolling. Because the U.S. government and the alphabet agencies, they've meddled in some elections. <laughs> I only wish there had been like a, a like a JavaScript animation of like an American eagle. <laughs> <laughs> like a text animation. Yeah, of, <laughs> or a marquee that bounces back and forth. USA. USA. <laughs> Maybe we should get to work on a better version of that. Sounds like a plan. This really, like, it was a toss-up as to whether or not we included this story in the nonsense section or in the security section. Well, that's kind it's of a security. serious topic, though. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's easy to take a flippant attitude toward this, but it's it's pretty serious. So, Grindr, which is a dating app, is letting other companies see user HIV status and location data. So, Grindr, there's a lot of options for choosing how infected with HIV that you are. And a lot of other things that they seem to collect in terms of, you know, your your profile. <laughs> now, BuzzFeed describes this app as What's a it? gay hookup app. That's, so. well, I think that's, that's what it is. Yeah. I don't think that's how they advertise themselves. 3.6 yeah. million daily active users across the world. Uh, two companies. Yeah, I just. This was basically the same story as Facebook. There was a third party, two third party companies that were scraping grinder user data or it was being sold to them or whatever and whoever whatever programmer was like they're like hey share this data with these third-party companies and they're like export all <laughs> and maybe should have gone through the fields and asked themselves do they need to know the hiv status That's, and uh, is it safe oh well, we were talking about this earlier we is it like a HIPAA? It's not, it turns a out. Medical, a medical issue since it's medical data. You would think that medical data is protected, but HIPAA is not about protecting medical data. It's about medical institutions and the way they handle data. Grinder, it's not a medical... I mean, I, I don't think Bubba from Grinder is qualified healing. to do a colonoscopy. <laughs> so... <laughs> wow. I don't think it qualifies as a <laughs> violation. <laughs> That's... Oh. There's so much wrong with that. Yeah. Oh. yeah, you took that to the to the, the very place it should not have gone. Uh, well, that's but, where uh, we'll end like the transmission. <laughs> you really went down the rabbit hole there. Maybe <laughs> you usually you want to man. I'm just I'm sorry. It's just not. It's a weird episode. <laughs> oh, we'll see. Let's see. We're getting in the mood. We're getting in the mood for the nonsense. Nonsense. That's Friday. We'll see you Friday. Thank you.